Chapter 24 in the Jarvis focuses on the male genitourinary system. In addition to reviewing the normal and focusing on abnormal findings, practicing the subjective questions out loud, and practicing performing the objective assessment, you should focus on recognition of any changes that would be indicative of disease, infection, or cancer, and how to teach proper health promotion. We're going to review inspection of the skin, including sores, lesions, and discharge, percussion of the CV angles, and palpation of the testicles. A genitourinary focused subjective assessment should include questions about urination. Are they experiencing any frequency, urgency, or having to urinate more at night? Is there any discomfort with urination? Are they having any difficulty starting their stream or dribbling? What is the color of the urine? Ask about general genitourinary history, um, including incontinence and any history of surgery or disease. Ask specifically about any pain, lesions, discharge, or skin changes on the penis. Ask about the scrotum and self-care behaviors. Have they noticed any lumps or swelling of the testicles and do they perform testicular self-examinations? Ask about sexual activity and contraceptive use, and then about sexual contact with partners who may have sexually transmitted infections. For patients who are infants, children, adolescents, the elderly, or patients who have uh, homosexual contact, it's important to ask questions that would be very specific to their um, specific categories or needs. A um, homosexual male may have signs and symptoms of sexually transmitted infections rectally instead of uh, you know, penile. So think about kind of the overall picture rather than just um, staying within the box. When performing your objective assessment, you start with inspection and palpation of the penis and then the scrotum. If there is a mass present, you could transilluminate it. This would be more common at a higher level, like nurse practitioner level, um, during a full physical examination. You can palpate the inguinal rings for hernia and then palpate the inguinal lymph nodes. Inspection and palpation of the penis. The skin normally looks wrinkled, hairless, and without lesions. The dorsal vein may be fairly prominent the glands itself should be smooth without any lesions. If the male is uncircumcised, either ask them to retract the foreskin or you should retract it and it should move easily. You might find some discharge, they call it schmegma, underneath the foreskin um, and uh, that's normal. Just talk to them about uh, cleanliness and self-care. And then after inspection, make sure that you slide the foreskin back to the original position to prevent a paraphimosis. The urethral meatus should be positioned centrally at the tip of the glands. Inspect the scrotum as the male holds the penis out of the way. And there's good pictures in your book of this as well. Or you can use the back of your hand to displace the penis off to the side as you're assessing the scrotum and the testes. So palpate the scrotal skin uh, between your thumb and first two fingers, and you're feeling for the spermatic cord and making sure that you don't feel any masses or lengths. 
So you want to palpate the spermatic cord along the length from the epididymis up to the external inguinal ring. Um, so there should not be any other masses or lumps present within the scrotum. If the patient has something like hydrocele, especially in a younger child, uh, it may be difficult to palpate those structures due to fluid within the scrotal sac. To check for a hernia, you inspect the inguinal region for a bulge. The patient should be standing. Um, and it's easier if you're below the level, so you almost want to be eye level uh, with the uh, inguinal area while you're doing this assessment. Palpate the inguinal canal. Um, for the right side, shift the weight onto the left leg or vice versa. Place your index finger low on the right scrotal half. Um, palpate up the length, again, of the spermatic cord, feeling the, um, the ring, the external inguinal ring. Um, you can feel that there's uh, basically an opening where the testy had descended from. And then um, if you can put your finger into the ring, gently insert it into the canal and ask the person to bear down and you shouldn't feel a change. Um, that's kind of the turn your head and cough or just take a deep breath and kind of push down and then repeat the procedure on the other side. If you feel a bulge against your finger, that would be an abnormal finding indicative of a hernia. Um, and then you can also palpate the femoral area for a bulge. So this is just a picture example of um, palpation of the external inguinal ring to see whether or not any of the uh, uh, colon or any of the GI tract has herniated through a weakening in the abdominal muscle wall and come out the inguinal ring. Palpate the lymph nodes along the chain around the groin um, and then the thigh. And normally uh, you might find a small node uh, here and there, remember that nodes are kind of reactive. So like if someone had skinned their knee, it would be normal to have a slightly enlarged thigh node. Um, but if somebody has um, cancer, you're going to have large, hard, um, fixed nodes that are non-tender. So um, small, uh, less than one centimeter, soft, discrete, movable, um, kind of, you know, rubbery nodes are normal, uh, but once they start to get hard, uh, even discolored, um, that's abnormal. Even though we're not encouraging women to do breast self-examinations because they tend to lead to unnecessary um, radiologic exposure, we are still encouraging testicular self-examination in men. And so you want to start teaching this at about 13 to 14 years of age. And they should be doing this um, monthly in the shower, um, you know, at the, kind of at the end of the shower because the warm water relaxes the scrotal sac. And uh, basically they should just be doing kind of what you just did with uh, just examining the scrotal sac and the surface of the testes to make sure that there aren't any lumps or bumps or anything strange. Usually if the patient finds a false positive, they're palpating the um, spermatic cord and thinking that that's a lump. So some things that you could do, because obviously this might be a kind of an odd topic for a 13 year old, um, something that feels a little awkward. So some, some ways that you could phrase this. A good time to examine your testicles is during the shower or bath when your hands are warm and soapy and the scrotum is warm because cold hands will cause the scrotal contents to retract. The procedure is really simple. Hold your scrotum in the palm of your hand and gently feel the testicles using your thumb and your first two fingers. Your testicle should be egg-shaped and movable. It feels rubbery with a smooth surface. So that's a normal testicle, almost feels like a peeled hard-boiled egg. Um, and uh, my kids always giggle when I tell them that, but that's you know kind of what they should be feeling for. Abnormal lumps are very rare and usually not worrisome. But if you ever notice a firm, painless lump, a hard area, 
or if the testicle is painful or enlarged, you should call your doctor for further checkups or tell your mom. Um, prostate cancer and prostate enlargement are also another concern for this population. So there's a difference between benign prostatic hypertrophy and prostate cancer. Um, so gradual enlargement of the prostate is a normal part of aging. And benign prostatic hypertrophy is just a side effect of hormones. It's not related to cancer. It may have some similar signs and symptoms such as hesitation, difficulty starting a stream, difficulty fully emptying the bladder, some dribbling of urine, and uh, maybe even you know urinating a little more frequently at night. That is okay. Um, but as long as the PSA isn't elevated and there's no evidence of prostate cancer, it BPH doesn't turn into um, cancer. It does not raise the risk of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is tested um, for with a blood test. So it's a simple blood draw that we can test a blood test or they can do a digital rectal examination, which is referred to as a DRE. Um, <clears throat> there is some best practice discussion about um, doing the DRE versus the PSA screening tests. Uh, men who are at higher risk for developing prostate cancer, such as African American or men who have a first degree relative, father, brother, or son diagnosed with prostate cancer at 65 years or younger, should be offered testing earlier on. Very similar to risk factors for uh, women with breast cancer. So PSA is a prostate specific antigen and it's made by the prostate gland when the prostate cancer cells um, invade so if cancer cells invade the prostate cells the psa starts to get excreted at a high level um, and uh, other things can also cause an increased excretion so um, bph can cause a slightly chronic elevated psa increase as well as uh, prostatitis so if there's an acute infection of the prostate gland um, that also can cause a rise in psa um, there's also some evidence to suggest that blood should be drawn before the digital rectal exam because manipulation of the prostate gland can cause a rise in the PSA uh, temporarily. So digital rectal exam, you obviously want to use a gloved hand. The lubricated finger is inserted into the rectum and you want to make sure that you use a really gentle technique. Um, you never poke the finger into the rectum. You push the pad of the finger against the anus itself and then kind of bend the finger so that it pulls the anal sphincter open and allows the point of the finger to kind of tip into the rectal vault rather than shoving it into the rectal vault um, and if you're the patient you will definitely appreciate the finer point of that technique when you're looking at genital lesions, it's important to review these abnormal findings in this chapter to recognize the difference in some of these lesions, such as the difference between a um, genital herpes infection and a syphilitic canker. Um, but then also things that we find very commonly are things like HPV. Now HPV has more than 100 different strains and some of them are high risk which cause cancer and some of them are low risk which cause these uh, genital warts. Um, you can have more than one strain obviously, but somebody who has genital warts is at higher risk for cancer because it means that they have been exposed to at least some strains of the HPV virus. Um, externally, the warts, so the lower risk ones, look like soft, moist, kind of skin colored cauliflower shaped papules. Um, and if you put vinegar on them, they turn white. And if you put iodine on them, they stain kind of a yellowy brown color. Uh, so um, it's easy to kind of see them um, with a staining, same as when we do like our cervical staining in women. Cancer 
<clears throat> of the genitalia in men usually looks red raised kind of warty or ulcerated and has like a clear serous discharge and as it grows it oftentimes becomes very necrotic <coughs> excuse me there's um, a lot of um, uh, what looks like lymphatic involvement uh, a lot of tumors right at the the, uh, the tissue uh, and sometimes uh, both internal and external tumors because uh, it's right at, at the surface. There's not a lot of uh, skin or tissue depth at the penis. Um, it's usually painless, almost always on the glands or the inner lip of the foreskin, and it usually follows some sort of chronic like inflammation, irritation, um, and then enlarged lymph nodes. And if you look at uh, pictures of uh, penile cancers, that have um, gotten fairly severe. Usually all of the inguinal nodes uh, are incredibly enlarged um, and sometimes have these large black tumors uh, all around them as well. Um, urethritis, urethral discharge, and dysuria would all be signs of an infection, whether it is uh, a sexually transmitted infection, a urinary tract infection or um you know uh i guess those would be kind of my my main two um so infection of the urethra is painful burning on urination just within the urethra the meatus the opening is usually very red um swollen oftentimes it's tender to the touch like against um, underpants and uh, there's oftentimes discharge right at the tip of the meatus the urine is cloudy uh, with um, like mucus shreds and discharge in it as well um, so we culture that and when you do a male urine for urethritis you want what we call a dirty urine do not clean the penis you want a dirty urine and the reason for that is that um, if you're going to catch gonorrhea or chlamydia um, you don't want to have them wipe it away and and uh, pee it out and then start um, like collect midstream so normally if we want to test the bladder we do a midstream clean catch urine but with urethritis we want everything we want all the junk we, you know we want all the all the contamination caught into the urine so um, uh, gonorrhea has thick profuse yellow gray brown discharge if it's uh, penile if it's rectal it usually has really inflamed terrible painful itchy hemorrhoids and um, some bleeding non-specific urethritis uh, is just kind of less um, discharge and kind of mucosal and then about 50% of urethritis cases are caused by chlamydia um, it's, it's super important to uh, diagnose and treat gonorrhea and chlamydia they can also lead to um, like testicular problems like orchitis and uh, uh, further infection and loss of fertility when you're doing the rest of your assessment, remember that you want to percuss the CV angles in the back. So we've kind of talked about this in multiple um, uh, kind of units now. Uh, I typically do this when I'm doing my posterior lung assessment. So I, I kind of work that in. I listen to the lungs. I look at the back. I'm checking the skin, smoothing out any bed wrinkles, and I'm just you know gently percussing over the CV angles on the back. Um, to look for any pain that would indicate kidney stones, uh, problems like that. So renal calculi or kidney stones. In addition, you might have gross blood in the urine without signs of infection. You might have unilateral pain, specifically flank pain radiating to the groin and the testicle. Um, I have seen stones that are so large that they have become obstructive, not only in the ureters, but also trying to exit the bladder uh, and stones that are typically greater than like <clears throat> uh, six um, centimeters in size are very hard to pass. Uh, so 
um, you know, keep an eye on if we do CAT scans or whatever, keep an eye on the size of the stone and they may have to have like lithotripsy or something like that or stenting. Acute urinary retention <coughs> can occur from a stone, a blockage, a tumor, oftentimes from the prostate itself. The cure for that is usually um, fully placement. Lidocaine should always be used for a male before fully placement if they're not allergic to it to help ease the passage and to get past the prostate with less pain and spasm. And then urethral stricture can occur as well when uh, the person has um, a, a closing or narrowing of the um, the urethra somewhere within the penis that just causes a decreased amount of blood flow and it's very difficult then for the person to um, start their stream, empty the bladder, and it puts them at high risk for things like urinary tract infections. During inspection you would also note whether or not you there were any abnormalities structurally of the penis. Phimosis is the inability to retract the foreskin which increases the risk of infection. Um, and it can also create a problem if you needed to place a Foley or um, even could become so bad that it, there's some sort of a mechanical obstruction of urinary outflow. Paraphimosis is when you retract the foreskin and are um, you fail to put it back in place and then it actually causes a um, tourniquet of sorts where the glands of the penis then swells and you're kind of cutting off blood flow and you're unable to um, to place the foreskin back in the correct position that could become uh, essentially a surgical emergency that would require an emergent um, circumcision essentially to correct the problem. Hypospadias is when the urethral meatus exits the penis on the ventral aspect down here and epispedius is when the urethral meatus exits the dorsal aspect of the penis or on the top and this is usually repaired earlier on in life using the tissue from the foreskin so these babies are not circumcised immediately they're taken to the OR and then the foreskin is removed and used to repair the structural defect. The reason for repair um, has to do more with uh, fertility than um, anything else. So oftentimes it depends on how high or low the diversion is. Peroneus disease is illustrated in your textbook on page 715, and that is a shortening and fibrosis of the structures within the penis that causes it to become um, almost uh, curled or spiraled uh, through disease and you see this most commonly in men who have things like diabetes or gout um, and then priapism is a sustained painful erection and that could um, uh, be caused by side effects of certain medications uh, it could be caused by sequestration from sickle cell disease uh, and then also you could see that sometimes with um, cancer or leukemia or trauma. Uh, we also see it with spinal cord injuries um, with complete transection of the cord. Your book also reviews on 716 through um, 718 abnormal findings of the scrotum um, and the testes. So cryptorchidism is when the testicles fail to descend. This increases the risk of infertility as well as testicular cancer later in life. Some men have smaller testes, oftentimes related to like hormone imbalance uh, test or hormone therapy. Testicular torsion is a surgical emergency. Um, the testicle rotates within the sac and the blood flow is cut off. They usually present with excruciating pain and uh, unilateral swelling. Uh, they do get tested with a dirty urine for gonorrhea and chlamydia, but they need an emergent ultrasound to make sure that there's blood flow. And if not, then they go to the OR immediately for revascularization. Uh, epididymitis is uh, an infection that's usually caused by um, uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, 
um, and it can also be after prostate surgery. Spermaticord varicoceles or varicose veins <clears throat> within the scrotal sac. Spermatocele is um, basically a little cyst filled with uh, sp uh, sperm and seminal fluid. Um, there's tumors. Hydrocele is a uh, trapping of um, uh, abdominal fluid within the, um, the scrotum. And uh, that's not uncommon in young male infants. It usually resolves itself um, within uh, 12 to 18 months of life. And if not, then they'll surgically uh, go in and seal the, the opening shut. Um, and then you have some hernias that are discussed uh, here as well. So there's scrotal hernias, um, inguinal hernias, and femoral hernias. Uh, orchitis is uh, inflammation of the testy, um, and your book talks about it being associated with mumps. And um, then also uh, hydrocele is more common during acute orchitis and scrotal edema. And so people can get scrotal edema during things like congestive heart failure, um, portal vein obstruction, like you would get with cirrhosis of the liver, um, uh, epididymitis, <clears throat> um, torsion. And if the person has um, sort of, some sort of lymphedema, I've also seen it with acute anaphylaxis as well. Um, so review uh, those kind of abnormalities. Uh, be sure that you could recognize them if you were doing um, an assessment on them um, and no kind of normal versus abnormal uh, and the sores and the lesions and the kind of discharge. Um, anytime that you're you're assessing uh, a patient and they are complaining about something, just make sure you do a really thorough assessment. And if there's any concern for uh, infection, test for it. And if there's any concern for cancer, you want to refer them to a physician for further evaluation.